Muramai is going to walk us through the tutorial of using Mathematica to solve complicated torsional triangular cross-sectional problem. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'm going to try to cover twisting based problems, torsion based problems. I've tried to get some problems from everywhere, but it's this is like a uh, this is like a very important topic, I feel, because you've done normal stresses and there's, there's twisting, which brings about mostly problems you have done so far. You've always somehow got, you know, the shear stress is zero. But surprisingly, in problems like this, the shear stress is of the most value. There is no normal stress at all. So it is a pretty important part of uh, mechanics. Twisting is, especially, you know, twisting of rods and, you know, bars and all, it's pretty, why is this so small? Let me see. Okay, this is just this slide. Okay, awesome. Continue with this slide. Okay. So uh, this is a problem very similar to one of the example problems in class where there is an equilateral triangle. And we are going to go over the steps of the uh, you know, of the Prandtl function where you find out what the stresses are, what the moment is, what the torsional coefficient is, twist angle is, and so on. So uh, it says that the torsion solution for a cylinder of equilateral triangle, so a cylinder of equilateral triangle basically means like a bar with a cross section of an equilateral triangle, is derived derivable from the stress function. As professor has uh, discussed in class, you'll probably always get the stress function. So you don't have to worry about you know deriving the stress function. It'll be mostly there. It has been, so this, the, the way this stress function has been derived is pretty easy. So what, how do you derive, this stress function is basically saying, okay, the uh, stress function is zero at the boundary. So you just, you know, get the equation of each of the boundaries and put it here. So this is an equation I think of, would be of this one. And this would be of the bottom one or either way around, x plus one by three h is this one. So if, if any of the brackets are zero, phi is going to be zero. So that is how this per thing is divided, derived. So that is if, if in case the frontal function is not there, the go-to way would be something like this. So for example, if there is a square, then so say, say a, so this is y x, then it'll be something like x minus a into x plus a, y minus a into y plus a into k. This might not be it, but this might be a go-to way to do it. Good. Oh yeah, sorry, give me a second. Okay, so that'll be like a go-to way to do, yeah, go ahead. So I'm, 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 no, so this is, I'm giving you an example of the way to do it. This, as I'm saying, this might not be the Prandtl function, but if, if in a situation where you are, for example, you know, in the exam situation, for example, if you're given a reason to derive the Prandtl function, which you cannot easily find over the internet, for example, this would be a go-to way to start it because the condition, the major condition is that phi at the boundary is zero. It could be more complicated than that. I'm not sure. As in myself, I don't derive Prandtl function. So hopefully you don't have to do that. But it'll probably take, you know, more deeper understanding of the structural system to get what the exact uh, term is. But something like this works in this situation, the equilateral triangle, which is, you know, boundaries are zero. If any of the three brackets is zero, the point is on any of the boundaries, it's zero. So, that is what that is what the Prandtl function is. Wait, is there a question? Oh. So, so in this, you know, everything else, you don't know what k is. So you have to find out what k is. And that is where you go through all the steps. So, so what is so now that step one was what is the Prandtl function? You have that you generally assume a function, it's generally given either way. So let's see. So you plug in the Prandtl function into the biharmonic equation. So this one. And uh, you say it equals minus 2g alpha. And this will basically give you an equ uh, equation in k. So you now get k in terms of all the known constants. So this I'm going to do using an online calculator. Everything I'm going to try and do using an online calculator. So, so this is a Wolfram alpha online calculator. You can just Google Wolfram and you'll probably get the Wolfram calculator. You'll probably get one online. So I find this very useful when doing. So there is like, I think there's a Mathematica uh, you know, computer tool for Wolfram for more detailed and more complex equations. But most most derivatives and 
mostly a lot of calculations can be done uh, on the online calculator. So you can just use that. So I'm going to try and do this. And um, I already have the function copied, so I don't have to you know, um, uh, write it again and again. So what it basically says is that the biharmonic equation, right? Plus So let's see what this is. Okay. So you, you do get something like this, which is minus 4x. Okay. So uh, well, that sounds interesting. Okay. Uh, Uh, okay, the only thing that is missing in the entire thing that I did was I did not I didn't add the k because the k is going to come out. It's not a it's not dependent on either x or y, right? So I can just directly add k in the final uh, value that I get. So now that I have this, let's go back to our original uh, question here. Minus four k h equals minus two g of a. And so you. Everybody understood, right? On Zoom as well, where this came from. I just tried to, you know, simplify the way I wanted to do the calculation. So this is how it came from. I didn't add the k there, you know, just it was not required. I think by adding the k also, it shouldn't really matter. You should still get it. But it's just like too many unknown constants. So I didn't want to do that. So it's minus 4kh. And that gives us um, k equals g alpha by is that 2h. G alpha by 2h. Sorry. Uh, so now, now you have k, right? So now you know the entire Prandtl function in its exact form in terms of g alpha. So you know what g is? Alpha is the twist per unit length. I mean, you have to find out what alpha is, but you know what it means. k was just like a constant out there. So, so now that you have solved step two and step three, you know what the value of k, so you move on to the next step. So let's see what the next step is. Um, okay, so step four and step five. So step four says uh, plug in the torque equation to get moments in terms of twist. So you have to get this. So how do you get that? So when you say two phi dA, that is basically, so it's when you say two phi dA, it's two phi dx dy dy dx, right? So there's a reason I'm doing dy dx is that let's look at this this thing again. So at a particular x, say I have a point of x, say I have x here. This is the x, right? So if I choose this x, then y doesn't go from any value to any value, right? There is a fixed set of values which y can take. So if there is an integration, then for a given x, the limits of y would be different. So if you go, if you look at this, then the limits here would actually be functions of x. So this entire thing, when you integrate, you'll get it as a function of x, and then you can integrate it with respect to x. So let's see what the limits are. So you, so the limit of x is simple, right? It's minus h by 3 to 2 h by 3. So that you know. So how do you find the limit of y? So limit of y you get by this vertical line here. And this is an equilateral triangle, right? So this angle is 60 degree, this angle is 30 degree, half of it. So let's see. So we know that this is 2h by 3. And this is x. So this part, if you look at the small triangle there, this is 2h by 3 minus x. And that is 30 degrees. So this side is this into tan of 30 degrees, which is 1 by root 3. So the limits of y go from minus, sorry, minus two plus one by root three, two h by three x. Is it part clear? I just, I'm trying to, sorry. Sorry? You take the integration of the whole triangle. So it's m uh, integration two integration phi d of the entire triangle. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for the line, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the way I did it, but yeah, that that makes sense as well. So you can just basically say that this is the limit of this line. So y in terms of x, you already know. So 
so that that's that's a good way to do it i i missed that but um you can just say okay so if you want to find out what this is then you can just say this equals zero and you can find y in terms of x you should probably just get this but that is the way i looked at it without the function so yeah but that's a good catch so so now that you have the limits of y go down to this yes we have integral No, no, no. What he's saying that the relationship between X and Y, you can get without uh, doing what I did, right? Yeah. So like this, the point, this relationship, Y limits are this. You can just simply get, because you have the equations of the limits in the phi already, right? So you can just set this, this one to zero and you can get the same thing that I got. And this one to zero will give you the other limit. So the limits on the top and the bottom. So that is that is a good catch. So that that'll probably make life easier. But now that you have the limits of y, so you just do minus one by root three. And just do one by root three. X into two by uh, dA. So I'm just going to do dy and then dx. And x goes from minus h by three to two h by three. So that is what our m is. So let's go back. I'm going to do this in our online calculator as well. So um, definite integrals, we have two definite integrals. So let's copy our function here. So two times that function. There'll also be a k, but I'm not writing it now. I'll add it later, it's fine. So just put y here, put x here. The limits of x are pretty simple. And this would be and this this be minus one by Two up to plus. So that's our integration. Let's see what that gives us. <laughs> Hell, with that, I can't do much about that. <laughs> Thank God. Let's see. Okay, awesome. So there's two h raised to five upon fifteen root three right here. I'm, I'm thankful. So that m equals k into two h raised to five. Hello, fifteen root three. And you know what k is, right? So where is that k? G alpha by two h. So it's g alpha by two h. This goes so g alpha h raised to 4, 15 root 3. So this problem is very similar, almost exactly similar to the problem that you must have done in class, where you had like, you know, x minus a bracket. So just in this problem, a is minus h by 3, that's it. So if you want to go through this problem again, if you want to check, you know, your calculations anywhere, then that is the problem you have to go through. So now that you are, you have your m, we can calculate the torsional constant. So torsional constant is basically m by j. Sorry, uh, m by g alpha, that is j. So it'll be h raised to 4 upon 15 by root 3. So all of that you have. And the actual question is, the actual question needs you to find the maximum and minimum sharing stresses. But I'm just going, going through everything step by step. So there's maximum and minimum sharing stresses and the twist angle alpha. So um, Let's 
search function. So the twist angle, you have to find mostly everything in this, you have to find in terms of M, for example, because generally when you're given a torsional problem, you're given what is the torsion applied, right? So in this, in this entire situation, K is not known, M is probably known. So you can just, uh, getting alpha is just, you know G, you know the material properties of whatever you are dealing with. So alpha is simply 15 root 3 M by G H raised to 4. So that is your uh, twist per unit length. So you already have that. And yeah, the stresses. So stresses is simply del phi by del Y minus del phi by del X. I'm not doing this now because now you know how to do it. So when you go home, open the Wolfram calculator, put in your phi values, put in your Y values, you'll get some, so you get tau x z as, you know, some g alpha, whatever, something in g alpha h, g alpha h x and y. So try to get it in m, just, just to be, you know, every time you try to get it in m, because that is how the problems are going to be. Given a torsion, external torsion m, what are the stresses and stuff like that. So substitute, for example, substitute alpha in terms of m. So now you have what the shearing stresses are. So get both the shearing stresses, find out which what is the maximum shearing stress. You mostly at the boundaries in this case, but you can check that out. So you know how to get the maximum of something, right? So you just try to figure out where the maximum is. It will be basically simple equations. I think I have them somewhere. I've, I've already, since I've already solved this problem. But I I think I, I, I would let you guys solve it. So just put the values in the calculator, get what they are. I'll tr I'll try to share this uh, by the weekend so you can go through it yourself. <clears throat> and you can um, and you can compare the values that you get with those in the lectures. Just substitute, I think, A with minus H by 3. That's it. So are there any doubts in this part of the problem? Can you go over how you got your limits of integration again to solve for n? Okay. Okay, so the limits of integration for m is the limits of integration for x and y, right? So you cannot just go like x from 0, sorry, x from minus h by 3 to 2h by 3 and y something like that because the limits of y at every point here depend on what the x value is, right? So they're different here, they're different here. So this is basically some function of x. So how do you get that function? Uh, there are two values, uh, two ways to do it. One is to actually find out what this length is. So you can just do if this length is something like this, just do from minus that to plus that. Those are the limits, y limits. And you put them inside. So this entire thing is now a function of x and you can integrate it. The other way that was pointed out was you already have the equations, right? You already have this equation of this line. So if you set this equal zero, for example, then you get y equals uh, one by root three, x minus two by three h, so which is the lower limit, this limit. So you get the two limits from this as well. So it's basically what is the value of y as a function of x at the two boundaries. So that is that is that clear? Sorry. So the x limits are simple, right? So it's just minus h by 3 from here till up till 2h by 3. And for every x, the y limits are fixed. You could do it the other way around, of course. I mean, that is also fine. You could you could say y goes from, for example, um, what you can use is the minimum and the maximum, I guess. And you can just say x varies according to y. But I think that will be more complicated. This is easier. So you just have to, because X and Y are not, what do you say, uncoupled. They are they are dependent on each other, the X and Y limits. So that's why it's a little more involved. So unlike if it was, you know, if it was like, for example, if it was a square, then the limit of X would be minus A to A and limit of Y would be minus A to A. So it's not related. So you could do anything you want. This is slightly different. So that's, that's, that's the entire problem for parental function. <clears throat> 